Just before you listen to today's episode, this is a quick message to remind you that if you like what you hear, you can help support History Hack, which is run entirely by volunteers using our Patreon account. There are links on all of our episodes, or if a subscription is not your thing, you can also now drop us a line on Kofi, which is just the equivalent of buying us a drink. So if you hear an episode, you like it, and you want to chip in just once, then you can do that too. Thank you. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. You've got me and Alex on presenting duties today and we're going to do something a little bit different, aren't we boss? We are. Well, you can take all the credit because you've gone off on a mission kind of to find some podcasts that are like future history, like the history of our future, basically. And this, to me, is so far is the standout one because we have Dr. David Nuffs, who is a lecturer and geochemist at the University of Bristol, specialising in using geochemical techniques to investigate changes in climate. He's the author of more than 60 publications on the topic, and he's here today to talk to us about a history of climate change. David, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much for having me. We've given you a big build up, no pressure. I know, exactly, more than six <laughs> I, I haven't counted them myself, to be honest. <laughs> Let's start with a, a re- what might sound like a dumb question to you, but oh, we've got lots of people that won't generally know the easy side of this. So, what I think setting this into context is important. What are you looking at in the course of your work? What actually do you class as proper climate change? rather than just a shorter term variation in what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I I think to start with, I don't think there's any dumb questions. Every question um, is is, is good to answer, right? And keep asking questions, I would say. Um, So, I mean, I get this question a lot, right? Like, oh, today's, I mean, today's quite a warm um, September day, right? So people ask like, oh, is this climate change or what's happening there, right? So probably as a rule of thumb, like what I'm teaching in in my class is normally like climate, there's a difference between climate and weather, right? So climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. Uh, So like you expect September to be a little bit cooler than August, that's what you expect, that's the climate, but this year that's not what we got. August was quite wet and cold, relatively well September, at, at least so far, appears to be warmer, right? So so we have weather is like the daily variation. You can snow, it can rain, it can sunshine, whatever. And climate is the long-term expectations that we have. Does it um, make you laugh then when you get like a day like today and people go, oh, the end is coming. This is climate change. The world is heating up. And you're like, no, it's just warm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a difference there. Uh, but of course, I mean, what we have seen is there's more warmer days. And so, I mean, there is there is a trend on top of it. So, so then you have climate, but climate is changing all the time, right? I mean, climate has always changed. Climate has never been stable, right? Um, so climate change, I mean, if you think about the history of our planet, right? Like so far we had warming around one, one and a half degrees since the pre-industrial time. In terms of planetary skills, I mean, what our planet has gone through, that's of course not significant, um, right? I mean, for us humans, this is a problem because we build city in, uh, cities in coastal places where sea level can threaten them or where hurricanes can smash them. And, um, but for the planet itself, uh, it, it might not, not matter. So climate change, a lot of things are changing in climate. It's just like, what's the impact of it, right? I mean, the planet could warm by 20 degrees and our planet would still be there, right? And even some forms of life will still be happy. It's probably just not human civilization as we know it will, will be there, but our planet will probably be fine with it, right? So climate change is happening on very different time scales, and, and that's what I'm looking at in my work. It's very different time scales and see. Um, yeah, so climate is changing all the time. That's my short answer, I would say. And the science behind what you do is, is genuinely fascinating. Um, it's not, I mean, we, neither of us are scientists, perhaps we should have got Kit on as our kind of science <laughs> expert, but explain to our listeners how you actually go about finding the evidence for climatic change. So are you using ice cores? I think I read that you also worked on mud core samples, or do you actually find evidence in, in other forms? Talk us through it. Yeah, so basically what I'm trying to do is reconstruct how climate changed in the past, right? Uh, and then we can use that to learn something about how the climate might change in the future, right? So that's sort of the essence of, of my work. Um, but the word past is quite a broad term here. Uh, I mean, I work on climate change that happened maybe over the last 120 years, or I also work on projects that focus on climate change 
250 million years ago, so even before the dinosaurs roamed the earth, right? So it's very different time scales uh, I'm working on. And depending on the questions, I'm looking at different archives. Um, I don't, so I don't, I don't personally work, tend to work on ice cores. I do a lot of um, mud samples, rocks, soils, peat cores, coals, uh, these, these, these type of things. Um, and basically what I do in these samples is I look for molecular fossils. So everybody knows fossils like a dinosaur bone, um, but all organisms, including you and me, they also produce molecular fossils. Uh, so this is the lipids that, that, that we make. And when we die, when organisms die, these can get preserved as well uh, in rocks, in muds. You can even find some ice cores. Um, and I analyze those molecular fossils and they tell me information about temperature, CO2 levels, uh, the type of organisms that were living there, the type of conditions, was it oxic, was it anoxic, these type of questions. So we have a very, very broad toolkit and depending on uh, the questions, we will be measuring different things in different samples. But typically we would take um, a natural sample, extract the molecular fossils, analyze them on a mass spectrometer and then interpret that into what was living there and what were the conditions. So you were talking about rocks. So you've got to bear in mind that you know we our idea of sources is things like you know there's a book or there's there's an <laughs> artifact this is a very different way of looking into the past so when you're looking at a rock and, and I know this is kind of coming at it from a, a very kind of layman's perspective but what can these things tell you you know what do different kind of is it different kind of balances of material within rocks that give you clues how, how does it work how do you kind of translate what you're seeing in terms of whatever it is that you can measure within that rock into so this is what it actually means from a uh, a climate perspective yeah so 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 like i said before we, we measure the molecular fossils right and the type of molecular fossils we can we, we can detect in these samples tells us something about the conditions just to give you an example if i find a rock um, and I analyze the molecular fossil there, and I find a certain type of biomarker that I know at present is only produced by diatoms that live uh, in sea ice or on the sea ice, for example. Then I can say with a pretty uh, confident, the, I can say like, well, at the time when this rock was deposited, uh, when this was formed, there must have been sea ice above it, because otherwise this molecular fossil would not have ended up there. Um, or I can say, see, hey, I see lots of bacteria, a certain type of bacteria here. That tells me something about the conditions. Maybe it was anoxic at the time of the deposition. So the type of molecular fossils I find tells me something. Um, so just to give an example, if, if, if I have a student in the lab that contaminates the sample by touching it with, with his or, or her own hands, we can also see that in the results, we can see uh, human <laughs> human markers and say, hey, somebody has been touching this rock, rock as well. So we can see contamination from that perspective. Uh, but we look for the molecular fossils and those molecular fossils can tell us something about the conditions, either because of the type of organism or the form of fossils, because fossils can also change depending on, uh, on conditions. Have to ask then, so the, the earth is 4.5 billion years old, give or take, isn't it? Can yeah. you just go all the way back looking for your, or if you've got you got limitations put on you by how perishable sources are or is it possible to just go back as far as the earth goes so so the first limitation is that we need to have rocks yeah uh, so rocks were not there from the beginning so you need to have rocks um but in addition uh molecular fossils uh degrade over time um mm. Now, some can be incredibly stable. It's not like DNA. Uh, some can be a bit less stable. So it depends on the type of the biomarker. The further back you go, the fewer options you have. Um, but to the best of my knowledge, the oldest known biomarker is uh, 1.6 billion years old. So that's sort of, so this is also one of the earliest rocks we have. Um, we have molecular fossils. And we have actually in those, we have marks of bacteria that we know today are living. So we can say, okay, this type of bacteria, we know it's producing these lipids today, and we find those lipids also in those old rocks. Um, in all the rocks, a big problem often is that during the drilling, they use often oil and that can contaminate. So contamination for these very old samples is a big problem. Um, so getting clean samples is a problem. But, but I mean, in terms of history, if you think about the last 
540 million years. So uh, this is the Fani Rezoic, basically when we had animals roaming around and these type of things, most things we know have lived. We can apply this, these, uh, these techniques. Although the further back you go, the li more limited you are. It's easier to reconstruct climate a thousand years ago than it is a hundred million years ago, but, but we still have lots of options. I mean, that certainly puts history into perspective. I mean, there we are talking about, you know, a hundred years, all oh, that was a long time ago, 200 years, well, that was a heck of a long time ago. And then you kind of turn up and you're going, yeah, but I can tell you some information about what was happening 1.6 billion years ago. Uh, but <laughs> that's quite humbling, I guess. So give us a sense of those earliest climate shifts that we, we know about. When do they happen? What are the causes? Are the kind of the first observable things, um, things like the, the growth of oxygen or, or the increase, I should say, in oxygen within the atmosphere. What is it? What, what's the earliest that we know about? So, yeah, I mean, changes in, in oxygen levels uh, of Earth, although we don't typically have biomarker evidence for that, that comes more from other evidence. Um, um, so in terms of biomarkers, one of the earliest biomarker evidence is actually the evolution of animals. So animals are, is complex life. Um, and and as far as we know, that only happened once. We only have one type of complex life on Earth. Um, and this origin of animals, the timing of that is heavily debated, right? I mean, even Charles Darwin was already... Um, uh, uh, the, the problematic thing is that once the Cambrian started, you had the Cambrian explosion, you had lots of complex animals, and then before that, there seems to be nothing. So they seem to be coming out of nowhere, which is not really how evolution, how evolution wor works. Yeah. Things need time normally. Um, so, but biomarkers can tell us something about the evolution of animals because certain animals, um, for example, uh, sponges, which are primitive animals, but they are animals, uh, produce specific type of markers. So you can analyze those in ancient uh, rocks and you can actually tell something about the evolution of animals when that happened. So that's some of the, the first biomarker evidence and that happened like around 630 million years ago. Um, Although this is very, very heavily debated whether these are actually real, whether they're contamination, whether they're actually uh, animal markers or not. So this is a very hot topic. Uh, but that's how biomarkers can, can shed some light in deep time about the evolution of animals. Um, and then in climate change, there's lots of evidence from across, across I would say the last 500 million years where biomarkers tell us some pretty um, big events have changed. Oceans have gone anoxic. Uh, uh, we have snowballs developing um, from very hot to very cold. Biomarks can tell us a lot, a lot of climatic change. One that I springs to mind straight away is Ice Age, the movie, because <laughs> this is climate change, uh, and I am a massive child and I love those films. So, what? How do we get this cycle? There's more than one ice age, and how does this cycle happen in history, where we get ice age thaw and then more ice again? Yeah, ice age. I mean, I also love this, love those movies. <laughs> um, so, ice ages, right? So, I mean, most people when they think about the ice age, they think about the one that happened twenty thousand years ago, um, when large large part of of uh, the United Kingdom and Europe and North America were covered by ice sheets. But we have lots of those, and actually, I mean. I can't count, but probably there's more than 50 of them over the last uh, few million years that happened in cyclic order. Um, but that is one episode, right? We've had glacial episodes further back in time. We actually had times in history uh, where most of the earth was covered by ice sheets. This is called a snowball earth, um, when basically the whole earth was covered by, by snow and ice. Uh, and this happened, this happened further back in time, um, but this can also happen. So there's very big extremes with no, I mean, 50 million years ago, we had no ice sheets. Today we have ice sheets on both poles. Um, yeah. So climate can shift up and down uh, from left to right. But if you focus on the, on, on the, on the ice ages that have happened the last uh, few million years that probably people are familiar with, um, those are ultimately triggered by changes in Earth's position regarding the sun. So the amount of energy we get uh, from the sun changes over time because our orbit around the sun is not a perfect circle. Uh, the Earth's tilt is changes and other things are changing. Uh, and that leads to very small change in the amount of energy we get, especially during the summer, uh, which is very important because if ice can survive over the summer, you can actually start to build an ice sheet. Uh, it can snow as much as you want, but if all the snow melts in the summer, it's not very good. So actually cold summers appear to be very important to get ice ages. 
Um, and actually, we don't need a lot. I mean, actually, like in Scotland, for example, you only need to change the temperature by a few degrees, and ice can actually start to survive across uh, across the summer. And when they do it in a few summers, of course, you can, you start to build an ice sheet. You're going to have feedbacks, and and everything's going to escalate, right? But ultimately, the ice age of the last few few million years are triggered by astronomical changes. And those are very rit rit rhythmical. We can, we can calculate them, we can put them in a computer model, we can calculate them back and they, they follow that pattern beautifully. And of course, we can also predict them in the future. So we know what's gonna happen in the future. Um, like we can predict the ice ages over, over the next two, three million years. Um, of course, the problem is that we as humans are now interfering with that. We're supposed to go into an ice age in, in a couple of thousand years. But that's probably not going to happen anymore because we pumped a lot of CO two into the atmosphere. How have humans generally responded and adapted to climate change in the past? Have you got any way of, when you do your work? Is that something you look at? So I don't personally look too much into the correlation between human civilization and climate change. Um, I mean that there's a number of events where people have linked climate change to collapse of civilization. Think about. Um, the civilization in Central America, uh, and there, are, that, there appear to be links with changes in climate there. Um, and and the, the, the point to highlight there is that there's actually those are relatively small changes in climate had big impacts on, on early civilizations, right? Of course, those, those ancient civilizations didn't have maybe the um, capacity to adapt that we now have in our Western, especially in our Western society. Uh, but what what I would conclude from, from, um, from looking at the past is relatively small change in climate had a big impact on ancient civilization. That leads us on really nicely to, if you like, the elephant in the room that, that underpins you know, this whole concept. And we're, we're, we're talking about you know, this week is about kind of the, the history of the future. So man-made climate change. I'm keen for you to set what we are doing to this planet within context. So how does this compare to previous shifts in climate that the earth has experienced? And you touched on this a little bit at the start by kind of saying that, look, you know, humanity might not survive, but the planet will. So, so where does this sit? And I'm thinking here in part in terms of the time scale in which it's developed and also kind of where this sits in terms of the other big shifts that have happened um, over the earth's history. Yeah, so like I said before, climate is always changing and will, and will always change. Um, what's happening currently is that we are very rapidly changing the climate. So we've had pretty extreme climate change. Climate has warmed by four or five degrees um, and cooled again by four or five degrees, which has a massive impact on, on ecosystems. We see species go extinct, ecosystems change, ice sheets grow and everything. Um, but in the past, all the natural climate change all happens on time scales 10, 100, 1,000 times slower than what we're currently doing. Um, so what we're currently doing is in, in basically in one, one and a half century, we have warmed the planet by one and a half degrees. We're probably gonna warm it by another degree in, in a few decades. That is completely unprecedented in Earth's history. In Earth's history, Climate is changing all the time, but it's doing it over tens of thousands of years, if not slower. So the rate of change, that's the problem. And of course, rate of change depends whether you can adapt as species and things. Like when things go slow, species can adapt, they can evolve, they can move. Uh, when things go very fast, it becomes harder, right? For example, a tree, trees can move up and down slow, like they can spread their seeds and everything, but they can't change within one generation. They can't all move. Um, uh, very far north or south, right? And the same with other species. So what we're currently doing, the rate of change, that's unique. The degree of climate change is not unique, but the rate of what we're doing, that appears to be unique. Um, almost nowhere in Earth's history have we seen such a rapid climate change. Probably one of the few exceptions is um, the Cretaceous Pedogene boundary when a meteor hit our planet, which was instantaneous climate change and horrific climate change. And, mass extinctions that killed the non-avian dinosaurs, among others. Um, but besides that, uh, we are probably doing something that the Earth has not seen for a very, very long time, if ever. Um, and do you see that as a kind of a measurable entity within your work now, or is this something that we can simply identify because we have that ability to measure what's in the atmosphere? 
So, I mean, we can reconstruct quantum in the past, right? And no time in the past do we see it happening as fast as we see things changing now, right? Uh, and I mean, just to put things into context, right? CO2 levels now um, are around the, like 410, 420 parts per million. That's higher than they've been for two, three million years, right? Um, and they've been declining since then. So we have in basically in a hundred years, um, we have reversed a decline that took around two to three million years. Um, so that is putting it into perspective. And to be honest, climate change is really changing the climate system very fast. This next bit's gonna get dark, but I think we have to, to be very frank about this. And you've already been yeah. very frank about the fact, you know, you know, we are doing this at a phenomenal rate. And I think particularly what you've just said about, you know, we're reversing two million years worth of reductions in CO2 levels in the atmosphere in the space of 150 years. It is hopefully quite a sobering thing that makes people kind of sit up and pay attention. It's, it certainly seems that there has to be a tipping point, right? That there's a, a brink beyond which it's probably too late to backpedal. And, you know, that's something that I was thinking, writing these questions and listening to what you're saying. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if that's perhaps wrong because of what you say about, you know, life in some form can go on beyond. We're only concerned with our lives, aren't we? Yeah, we're exactly. Like you know, civilization. Is, is like... But yeah. then presumably the dinosaurs would have been the same. They would have been like, screw letting these like two legged things come along and take over. We're only interested in ourselves and, and they're not here anymore. So, I mean, where is that tipping point? And I don't know if necessarily that's something that you can answer, but sometimes it feels like we're we're at it, you know, kind of right now. And this is why there are pushes to accelerate things like the, the Paris Climate Accords. But you look at the forest fires and the way that that pumps more CO2 into the atmosphere, creating this kind of runaway spiral. How close do you think we are to a situation where we as humans have basically scuppered ourselves? I mean, we know also from looking in the past, we know there's tipping points in the climate system. We know if we push the climate system in a certain direction, things will escalate quite quickly, right? For example, the Gulf Stream can stop um, or slow down at least. We know in the past this can happen. If you dump a lot of fresh water in the Atlantic, you can slow down um, uh, the Gulf Stream, which has a lot of implications, for, especially for Western, Western Europe. And those seem to be tipping points. It seems to be, it's going fine, it's going fine until it doesn't anymore. And you have a major major collapse there. It does recover again as well, so um, it's not all is lost there. Um, and there's lots of other tipping points in the climate system building. Some we know, some some we don't know. Um, so if you ask for a tipping point, I don't think there's one tipping point. Um, to point to. there's lots of different ones. We have um, we have the permafrost that can melt. Of course, those are feedback mechanisms, right? Um, but one thing we know from studying the past, the climate system is very complex. It's never, you press one thing, one thing happens. Everything is connected. Uh, so every tipping point will also have a negative feedback associated probably that will stabilize it. Uh, now that might take tens of thousands of years for that to stabilize, but our planet tends to bring things back to normal. Extremes are normally like um, even, even out again. So, um, so yeah, our planet will be fine. Most species will probably be fine. Um, you might even debate that maybe humans will also be fine. The question is just whether it will be fine for all humans or mm -hmm. whether it will just be fine for your, uh, humans in Western society that are rich and can build maybe something against sea level change, for example. Well, if you live in Bangladesh or some island in the Pacific, it might be harder. Um, or maybe parts of Afra, Africa will become uh, unsuitable for humans. Um, so there's lots of different questions here, right? Like for whom it will, will be affected, um, what will affect whom and, and who's worse off. Um, so I don't think that's one tipping point. Um, and, and coming up, I don't know if that really answers your question. It's uh, I think the whole tipping point argument is maybe, I don't know if that's the right discussion to have. We know there's lots of tip, tipping points. Mm. We know if we change the climate more, things will get, things will change, right? And you can debate whether that's good or bad, right? I mean, you can have probably an argument whether we need a green and ice sheet, right? Um, I mean, maybe it's not about 
leaving it as long as we can before and maybe it's just about actually just getting our shit together now so that we don't get to a tipping point and we don't have to have that discussion yeah i mean that could be i mean if he's i mean that's i mean that's the ultimate goal of the paris um the paris agreement right we try, try to stay below one and a half or at least below two degrees celsius so we don't cross cross any of these thresholds that that's the idea right because we stay below two degrees the idea is that we're not crossing any thresholds um now whether we can reach that or not is is, is of course is, is gonna it's gonna take a lot of effort from everybody right everybody that's listening to this um probably has to realize that their life is going to change quite significantly um in 20 years, a lot of our economy will be very different. And you can already see that part. You see electric cars over the last five years have become more, um, more, more widely used. But in 20 years, a lot of things will probably look very different in our economy. Um, and that's a big change, right? If you think about, I mean, I, use, I always tell my parents, like if you think, uh, my students, like if you think about your parents the last 50 years, nothing has really changed significantly, right? You've had the internet, yes, we have had that, but in our e economy, we had a fossil fuel-based economy for the last 60, 70 years, right? That's gonna change in the next 20 years. You're gonna see a lot of change happening. Um, and we have to do that because otherwise we might cross a number of tipping points that will not be good for ecosystems and, and part of human society. Um, and even if you think about all the carbon we put into the atmosphere already over the last 200 years, that will stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years, right? Uh, unless we invent something that can suck out CO2 from the atmosphere uh, on, on the wide scale. But, but this CO2 will stay there for a long time. Um, that taps into to two questions that I had, one of which is, you know, do you look at the change that is happening and are you encouraged by that? Do you look at it and kind of think, you know what, this is great, but you buy an electric car, that's just a drop in the ocean in terms of a much bigger picture. But then equally in terms of that, that process of potentially manipulating the climate to reduce CO2 that's in the atmosphere, is that something that should be um, investigated? Is it something to be encouraged or is that potentially dangerous because we're then interfering with a, another process? And <laughs> That we may not necessarily understand. Okay, I'm I'm not an expert on geoengineering um, or all of these things. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to want to uh, want to comment on that. I forgot what your first what the first question was. Whether or not you're encouraged about the things that are, but the things that, that are happening, right? Well, I mean, you you said like, should I buy an electric car that's just like one drop in a big ocean, right? And and of course, that's always the argument, like, oh, but people in China and America they're doing so much more. That's always the argument. But but if nobody is changing, nothing will change, right? So even if you get an electric car, put solar panels on your roof, uh, these little things they do help, right? And um, and, and they also make sense financially, right? Putting solar panels on your roof. I have solar panels on my roof. Financially, they make sense, you know? Um, so it's not only doing good, uh, you're also actually saving, saving some money in the process. So things are changing. If you see now how our economy is, 10 years ago, it looked very different, right? You see electric cars becoming more widespread. You see more renewable. Coal consumption in the UK is declining quite rapidly. Um, so we are moving in the right direction, but it's not going to be an easy move, right? And I think everybody understands that. It's not easy. It's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of money to be basically have to restructure the entire economy. We've had a fossil fuel-based economy for at least 70 years. We have to change that big oil tanker around and go to a renewable economy. And that's going to, that's going to take time and resistance and um, but, but, um, but I think change is happening. Uh, you can see it coming. And I'd like to say, I think in 20 years, our economy looks very different from what it looks nowadays. Just for our, this has been amazing. Um, it's been really insightful talking to someone who looks at the planet's past to understand what's going to happen in the future. But how can people find out, how can people understand this better? Uh, not only your work, but climate change in general. I mean, are there any good publications out there that are good for a general reader or? I mean, I mean, sort of the, 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 the Bible for climate change, you can, of course, read the IPCC reports. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, the latest report was just uh, just released, uh, released last month. 
Now that's quite dense. They also have a summary for policymakers that is probably a good idea for people to read. I mean, basically, the IPCC report is guiding governments, right? We've all signed to the Paris Agreement, so we have to follow this. So if you want to understand what's happening and what the government is going to do in the next few decades, probably having a vague understanding of what's, what's written in the IPCC report is probably not a bad idea. Yeah. Although I do understand that's not easy reading material. Although the summary of policymakers is relatively easy to read. But, uh, but there's lots of other resources. I mean, the Met Office, for example, has a really good website on climate change where they explain a lot of different things about climate change. Uh, that's probably a good, a good source. Um, and there's lots, of, there's lots of other websites. But I would probably start with going to the IPCC website, maybe understand what yeah. the IPCC is, have a bit of a read there. Uh, and, and check out things like the Met Office, their web pages, and, and take it from there. Uh, just that people have a vague understanding of like what's happening, what's the basis, um, so that people say like, oh, but climate has changed all the time. You can actually say yes, but I can explain to you why this is not relevant or why what we're currently doing is problematic for the way we are living as a human society. Can I chuck, this has been quite weighty, and necessarily so, but can I chuck a more lighthearted question in before we go? Yeah, yeah, of course. We mentioned Ice Age. As historians, we sit here on this podcast slating every historical film that comes out. Do you watch things like 2012 and just go, oh, this is just rubbish, this would not happen? Oh, I actually don't, I have not watched 2012, <laughs> uh, far before that reason. But, but I think that's with every scientist. When you see, I mean, there's also the day after tomorrow, which yep. talks about the slowdown of, of the Gulf Stream. There's the core, which talks about, the core. I mean, when it's what about the, the core, the one where they make the big caterpillar drill thing? Yeah. The Hillary Swank can go all the way to the center of the earth and just yes. detonate nukes to make the earth start doing stuff again. Exactly. I mean, I mean, it's entertaining, right? We all yeah. understand <laughs> that this is not hardcore science. I mean, I'm a Star Trek fan. And when you watch that, you also think, like, OK, that's probably also not very <laughs> um, scientifically all the time. But that's fine, right? And it doesn't have to be a doom story about climate change. I think that's quite important, right? So we know that climate is changing. We know it's because of humans, but we can change that, right? And, and like I say, over the last decade, we've started to see a lot of initiatives. The Paris Agreement, I think, is quite, quite an amazing agreement. Um, and things are changing. So yeah, it's not always going to be fun, but I, I, I think we're on the right path to make things change. And Yes, climate will change. We will lose certain aspects of our planet, like maybe some coral uh, reefs will lose some ice sheets, some glaciers, and all of that. Um, but I don't think it's a doom story. I don't want it to be a doom story because people also switch off when you tell people doom stories because it's not very entertaining when people tell you, oh, the world is going to end. You can you cannot do anything. I mean, people don't. That's not useful, right? We can actually do things, and we are doing things. So we are in the, on, on the on a good path, I would say. And I think it's actually quite hopeful, uh, although people might feel like, oh, it's all bad and doomed. Um, I don't think it's that bad. I think we'll still have a human society in 20 years um, and it will look very different from how it looks today, which is good. I think that's a really nice and positive point on which to end, you know, that, that there is hope in amongst all of this. And yes, the situation is, of course, serious and it needs addressing, um, but you know, th there is reason to be optimistic about where we can go if we're all prepared to, to do our bit. David, this Absolutely. has been really eye-opening um, and hugely interesting. I know our listeners are going to have loved it. Thank you ever so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I loved it. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.